for my left. Um, left you with the, the thought about the cell. Um, and as somebody mentioned to me in, in great time, uh, it sort of connects a little bit with the monastic tradition and the vow of stability <coughs> that we take. Um, and I think it all comes from that same sort of thread, really. Um, Uh, I, mean, I think it's symbolic in so many ways and what you can read there. And I love that little passage of Nelson Mandela. Um, very simple, very direct. But I think he says, I think he says exactly what the desert hunters would say. Um, and he had that same intense experience, of course. And on the other side, I think it's from Archbishop Rowan Williams. Now, I had to choose a little thread for the rest of it because there are lots of topics you can pick up on. Um, but I've chosen the, the thread of thoughts because that's a big theme in the desert. And what we do with our minds, that the renewing of your minds transform you, says St. Paul. What we do with our minds, what happens in there, um, is rather crucial for the desert fathers and mothers. The very first saying in the Apothecata, in the and Anthony the Great is, says the holy Abba Anthony, when he lived in the desert, fell prey to a sedia, that's a listlessness, that sort of depression really, and a great gloom of thoughts. Um, again and again, you see that the fathers and mothers are struggling with thoughts. What's going on in their heads? Um, my thoughts trouble me, what shall I do? Help me, my thoughts trouble me. Um, and within us, we have this tug and war, really, about the thoughts that are going on uh, within. And what, the, what they often testify to is... Uh, sorry, that's a that's, that's pin tread on it. Anyway. Um, What they testify to, there was a tag. Have you got it? I think I stepped into the table. It's a bit dangerous, that's why I put it in this way. It's a bit dangerous if I'm asking. It's a bit dangerous. I used to try to let it go right through. But um, anyway, I'm in a divided. This is a theme. I mean, I mean, St. St. Paul says, you know, I, I find myself doing the things I don't want to do. And we can all testify to that. You know, we try to be charitable and something else comes out. And we try not to judge, and the first thing we do is judge. You know, we know what we like, and they know, the desert fathers and mothers know what we are like. But they talk about this sort of inner dividedness within. Um, G.K. Chesterton, in one of his, says, that, uh, says Father Brown solved his mysteries by imagining himself into the mind of his murderers. You may think a crime is horrible because you could never commit it. I think it's horrible because I could commit it. Therefore, the grace of God, go by. Um, so they talk about this inner dividedness. Um, and yet they say, Abba Pambu says, if you have a heart, you can be saved. So they talk about the healing. When we're talking about mind, hearts, we're talking about the same sort of thing, really. Our feeling, our thinking, our emotions, all caught up in the same sort of thing, really. Now, one of the ways, so they talk about thoughts, these thoughts that come. The battle is inside, in the soul, in the thoughts, says a pseudo Macarius, um, Syrian rather than um, um, Egyptian, but the same sort of theme really. They talk about stewardship of the mind. Um, I'll just say this little story uh, from Anselm Brun, which is about words, but uh, it's but it's much the same. It's it's much the same thing. A little while, a nurse who worked in a rehabilitation centre. For those with mental illnesses, told me about a patient 
a young, intelligent, beautiful girl. She wasn't making progress despite all the attempts to work with her and different therapies like work therapy and music therapy. She always had the same response, I can't do it, I'm useless. In the end, the doctor says, your words are your life. Your words are your illness. Her own thinking had made her sick. She had hammered home these thoughts to such an extent that she was unable to get well. Now, one of the concerns of the elders is that we, is what we do with our thoughts and how we run the tape again and again, how we hammer home things, and actually our thoughts make us ill and lead us into bad ways of thinking. Now, their way of describing this might not be the way you would describe it today. They talk about demons. They seem to imagine that a demon is coming up and planting a little thought in your, in your skull, in your, in your brain. Um, perhaps, as I said, we don't think um, in, in the same sort of way. It depends how you... Um, I suppose Christians are divided as to, as to what they think in terms of evil, the devil, Satan, demons. Um, some see it as more symbolic. Um, some quite uh, take it quite literally, really. Um, and that doesn't really matter. I mean, I think the point is that they talk, that there's a real struggle. They might use the word battle, but it's a struggle. And, the, and I think even if they use talking about a demon goes up and says to, to Abba so and so, um, I, the demon might be a projection of what's going on within. So, um, and I think they realize that it's a sort of psychological. It's a psychological struggle. Um, demons don't always wear horns. Um, um, the, the struggle can go on within. And of course the model for that in all that they say was, was Christ going off confronting Satan in, in, in the wilderness. So that was the sort of model for a lot of this in, as a scriptural model. Here is a it's not a demon, but I saw this in one of the temples in Egypt. It's a, I'm showing here a, a figure of a, of a demon in the temple of Dendera. Um, it looks pretty fierce, and I suppose if you imagined demons like that. Or uh, we have our own local demons in Herefordshire. This is a manuscript from Abbey Door, which was the Cistercian Abbey in the 12th century. Very beautiful. Someone mentioned it this morning. Um, and there's a little monk holding um, it looks like one of those sticks that you sometimes use to open windows with, you know? But there he's trying to grab the monk and pull him from his choir, pull him from his prayers. Um, so um, demons are up to all sorts of things. And the point is we have to watch, watch for the demons, really. I mean, the basic point is we have to watch for the spiritual traps in our lives, really. Call it a demon, call it whatever you want. The point is... We have to be watchful in our spiritual lives. What are the traps that I fall into? The conversations I fall into? The patterns of thinking I fall into? So, you know, we're not far removed from thinking about practical things, really. Um, and, you know, another thing I wrote down here was, um, um, well, well, Amasyncletica, Amasyncletica says, they attack us from the, the outside and they stir us, they also stir us up from within. Um, our appointment says, our own wills become our demons. Um, <coughs> and, you know, you're all very good, holy, respectable people. But we all know how we can get enraged by something. How a jealousy, how a hatred can overtake us. I think it happens in all communities, in families. People fall out, people stop talking to each other in parishes. You know, these things happen to the best of people. And see, even, and particularly to the best of people. You know? Um, so the, these are very real issues, really. 
and they are concerned about how can we be healed. Um, were you tempted to divorce him? No, never. Murder, often. <laughs> um, and all these struggles um, are within. You might call, refer to them as your dragons, you know, if you don't want to use the word demon. Um, but there are different, different ways. Now, here's a holy prayer for you. You might have heard it before, or something like it. Grant me the serenity, ah, beautiful, what a beautiful prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I cannot accept and the wisdom to hide the bodies of those people I had to kill today because they really annoyed me. <laughs> Help me always to give 100%. 12% on Monday, 23% on Tuesday, 5% on Friday, etc. And help me to remember that when I'm having a really bad day and it seems that people are trying to upset me, that it, only, that it takes 42 muscles to frown and only four to extend two fingers to tell them to go away. Parodies <laughs> um, of those prayers you might have seen hang up on the wall of a church or a retreat house or something. Or here's another one. A daily prayer. I want to thank you, Lord, for being with me today, so, for being with me so far this day. With your help, I haven't been impatient, lost my temper, been grumpy, judgmental, or envious of anyone. But I will be getting out of bed in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I will really need your help. <laughs> I think the desert fathers and mothers can relate to this, really. You know? Um, I think they can relate to this, and this is what they're trying to get at. If you laughed at that, you, are, you understand yourselves. We understand ourselves. Um, and what they were concerned was bringing our thoughts to the light of day. Hence, in the relationship in the desert, they talk about the Amma and the disciple, the Abba and the disciple. It's, it's, it's a tradition that developed through the Irish church and the soul friend, the Amankar. I don't know about all that. Um, it, it, the Irish were instrumental in the development of the practice of confession in the church. Because in the desert, the sacrament of confession that we have today is, you know, you go to a priest in a box. Not necessarily a box, but that's how it's sort of pictured. But it started in the desert by going to your soul, friend, to the wise elder, of revealing the things that really troubled you. Um, now it developed and it became a bit more institutionalized and formalized, etc., via Ireland. Um, and, and it sort of merged with the other tradition of reconciliation in the church in the early church was if you did something wrong, seriously wrong, you had to go before the, the whole assembly and confess your sin. Um, now people didn't like doing that. That's why it was privatized into the sacrament of confession the way it is today. People think, well, why should I go? Well, would, would people like to do it in public again, in front of everyone? No. I suppose it's the gentleness um, of the church in a way of finding, a neck, of finding a way. Now, whether it's an elder or whether it's a friend, we need friends. We need honest people who will tell us the truth. We need spouses. We need friends. We need whoever. We need people to be honest with us to grow. And if we don't accept that honesty, don't tell me what to do. Don't, you know, we need it. And, 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 and this is very much what this is about, really. We need to strip ourselves of illusions. Uh, we need to come to the truth. Columbus Stewart, a monk writer, he actually studied at St. Bennett's across the way. Um, very good writer. Um, he says about Adam and Eve, the Desert Fathers were committed to breaking the cycle of deception that began with Adam and Eve. It could be said that the great tragedy of the fall was not so much that they disobeyed, God could handle that, 
The tragedy of Adam and Eve was that they hid. Far from thinking themselves like God, they thought of God like themselves, and thinking that God could not bear failure, they hid. We mustn't ha hide from the truth, particularly if we want to grow. We mustn't hide from the truth that I might be an angry person, I might be harboring jealousies, I might get so resentful that I do have lusts, that I do have greed. Um, you know, to grow spiritually, we need honesty. And that's one of their themes, stripping ourselves of illusions and honesty. Um, now I'm gonna give, give you a quote from someone completely different. <laughs> um, it's not the crime that kills you, it's the cover-up, I heard Henry Kissinger say about the Watergate scandal, and that's it really. It's not the crime itself. You know, God will cope with the sin. He loves us when we run to him with our sins. But if we won't make that step, if we won't try to do something about it, and this is the theme that you see in reading these stories. I'm trying to give you a sort of a few threads in a sense as to what, what they're talking about, what happens. Now one of the ways that they they, they talk about this process. So that's a little bit about being honest and, and that sort of thing. But one of the themes that they talk about is thoughts. Um, the word is logismoi. Um, now, you might be familiar with the word logos. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word logos, the word. Words. And I think that's a very positive thing. Talk about Christ there. Uh, John's Gospel. But for them, log logismi are negative thoughts. And they sort of imagine the demons as coming and just planting a little negative thought in our heads. Really. And they've got quite an analysis of, of how thoughts work. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you, how thoughts work. Um, and they talk about, well, first of all, the demon comes. So whatever you think of the demon, anyway. Demon comes, puts a little thought. Oh, that's a nice, little, juicy thought. Um, the suggestion. Um, and um, the suggestion comes. So uh, we'll come to, then there's the dialogue, play around with the thought. Um, that's, yeah, yeah, I like that. Well, I shouldn't do that, but yeah, you know, it goes around in your head. Then you give in to the thought, the consent. So these are four stages here. Temptation, suggestion, dialogue, consent, and then you're taken captive by the thought, and then finally, you, there's the action. So let's go back over these a little bit, now in detail. So you begin with temptation, and I think the really encouraging thing that they say, for me, is that to be human is to be tempted. You know, um, John Cashman says, our mind is like a wind. We cannot stop it to turn. We have powerful imaginations, powerful things going on in our head all the time, desires, memories, imaginations, all going on in our head. We're going to have thoughts. And I have to say, in the sacrament of confession, reconciliation of the years, I wish I had a penny for every person who's come to me saying, I'm troubled by this thought or that thought. We all are. But the encouraging thing, as they say, is that don't worry so much about the thought. Obviously, you know, but the problem really is if we follow it through. We don't want to be plagued by thoughts. But at the, at the same time, you know, just because I have this thought doesn't make me a bad person. And the trouble is when people identify with that thought and they feel bad for having the thought. Sometimes we can't stop having the thoughts. And I think that's an important thing to say because people do get troubled by, I shouldn't think, why do I think this? Well, and the more you try to stop thinking about it, the more you think about it, you know? So don't get troubled at that level about thoughts is what they, is what they tell us. Um, Here's a little story. A brother came to see Abba Poyman and said to him, Abba, I have many thoughts and they put me in danger. The old man said, 
led him outside and said to him, Expand your chest and do not breathe in. But he replied, I cannot do this. So the elder said to him, If you cannot catch the wind, neither can you prevent distracting thoughts coming into your head. Your job is to say no to them. So, okay, then you can't stop them coming in, but just don't follow through. Don't follow through on them. Um, again, temptation. Um, this is an anonymous saying, probably from the back race. Uh, unless a tree is shaken by the winds, it will not grow uh, as not to put out any roots. That, that's, the boat, that, that's the monk. Unless he is tempted and bears temptation, he will not become a man. Actually, temptation shapes us and grows us. It's not necessarily bad in itself. But we do need to be careful with the thoughts because they can lead us astray, they can cause problems. And there is a problem if we start playing around with these thoughts. If constantly we start thinking about these things, dialoguing with these thoughts. Um, now, as I said, we have, we're full of thoughts all the time. St. Aylre de Riva, the lovely Cistercian father from Yorkshire, well, monastery in Yorkshire, talks about the monastic life. In our most idiotic kind of daydreaming, we depict battles of kings and victories of dukes as though they were before our eyes, and we straighten out all the affairs of the kingdom with our idle ramblings, even as we sing, even as we sing psalms or pray, you know, we can't stop thinking. But the fathers say, the monk ought to be as the cherubim and seraphim, all I. We need to be vigilant, nepsis, vigilance. Um, talking about a monk here, we're talking about the Christian life. We don't need to make that uh, thing. Uh, I, phrase, I forget where this phrase comes, but I, I wrote it down. Be the doorkeeper. Watch what comes in and, and try, try, try to deal with it. Why? Because thoughts create feelings, feelings create behaviour, and behaviour reinforces thoughts. They were aware of this going on in, 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 in our minds. Um, the way I like to put it, quite simply, is, um, well, it, what's, what's, in, what's important really? One of the things that they emphasize in this, about having thoughts and not following through on the thoughts, they give great weight to our human freedom. Now, we can have a discussion about how free am I to resist a thought, because there are habits, habits of thinking, habits of behavior that sometimes we can't escape from, and they're not easy to get out from. So I'm not saying this is very simple, simple. You know, if, if you know, when we know if someone's trying to lose weight, you, you know, it's easy to say, well, just, just, just say no. Well, it's not always to say no, easy to say no to that chocolate cake. Um, we, you know, so there are limits to human freedom, behavior and things. But they do say, well, but don't forget we have that food. And sometimes we just give in and forget that we can actually say no. And sometimes we do have to say no to answering back to someone. Sometimes we do have to, to stop ourselves, catch ourselves. Um, because we only regret it afterwards. And so what they emphasize is that we have um, we have we have the freedom. Um, right, okay. um, one of my favourite authors, I have to say. So we, we, we're moving into look at, at, at the next the next stage here, which is giving in. Um, just one of my favourite books, and I don't know how many here would have read it. Uh, it's it's. By, by the wonderful Victor Frankl, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. It's one of my all-time favorite books. It's not an easy book, because it's about the psychiatrist's experience of the Holocaust. And the will, and why did some survive and not others? Um, not that there was a lot of choice, but he noticed that some people maintained that strength 
that will for me him. Um, and for him, it was in this sort of crucible of human experience, which was the concentration camps. There's no more raw experience than that. He said, for him, people survived because um, they took hold of that inner freedom that they had and took hold of it and, and said, whatever people do to me, I will maintain within my own freedom and dignity. I will hold on to that until to my last breath. That's a very brief, brief summary, really. But he talks about exercising our freedom. And, and this is a quote from him here, exercising freedom. The one thing you can't take from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. The last of one's freedom is to, choo is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstances. And the desert fathers and mothers will say, don't forget the freedom you've been given. We don't have to respond in these sort of conditioned ways that we respond, sometimes conditioned to ourselves. You know, I might have a problem getting angry with people. I've got to address that. Look at it. I've got to do some inner work on it. That's what they're saying. Why do I get so resentful? I've got to do some work on that. Um, what about um, you know, lust, pornography, thoughts? These are other very prevalent issues today. What about food-related issues? What about anyway, lots, lots of things really. Um, but the things are not easy to resolve. But unless you take small steps at resolving them, and one of the steps that they talk about is going through the patterns of thought. I mean, this is a sort of primitive psychology in a way. Uh, I wouldn't claim that what they're saying is the last word on all this. The psychologists, psychiatrists and things help us today with a lot more nuance and understanding, and sometimes perhaps contradicting a lot of some things that they, that they would say then. But they have an essential idea that this is an important part of our Christian life because how I am as a human being with others, in community with others, is an important part of my spiritual life. It's not just the quality, it's not just how well I say my prayers when I'm, up, when I'm on my knees. You know the story of the Welshman, and I can say this as a Welshman, who prayed on his knees on a Sunday and prayed on the rest of his neighbours the rest of his week, the rest of the week. Um, well, we can imagine that, you know. We mustn't forget our freedom. So the Desert Fathers propose that we exercise our freedom. They make the distinction, beautiful distinction, between having thoughts and acting on them. Um, and this distinction gives us hope. This distinction gives us hope. Now, there's a book you might have come across by Stephen Covey. It's been in the bestsellers if you read these sort of things, um, these sort of health, self-help books. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he says, um, in the midst of the most degrading circumstances imaginable, Viktor Frankl used the human endeavor of self-awareness to discover a fundamental principle about the nature of man. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Now I'm using a modern author here, and Victor Frank. But really they're describing what the Desert Fathers are talking about in terms of thoughts. That we have to work on our thoughts. Another way I like to put it um, is um, mind the gap. Mind the gap between the stimulus and response. The thought that comes into your head and how, how, how we respond to that thought. And sometimes we've got to say, a thought is just a thought, it's just a thought. I don't have to follow you through. I don't have to follow this little demon, as the Desert Fathers would describe it. So Evagrius, who is one of the great writers of the, of the desert, he also wrote a book, he didn't quite call it this, but we might call it, 
the habits of highly effective monks. Um, and what he says is, whether these thoughts disturb us the soul or not, does not depend on us, but whether they linger in us or not, and set the passions in motion or not, does depend on us. So, you know, with all these things, we need to try to cut them off at the root, really. So, because the problem, the suggestion, the dialogue, the consent, can't be taken captive by the thought. It's too late. It's too late at this stage turns into action. So Abba Moses, in the conferences of John Cashin, um, says this, it's impossible for the mind not to be approached by thoughts, but it is in the power of every earnest man, I'm sorry for the, the men and the, the language, but that's what the, it is in the translations, and, um, either to admit them or to reject them. Their rising does not depend on ourselves, but their admission or rejection is in our own power. It is to a great extent in our power to improve the character of our thoughts and to let either holy and spiritual thoughts or earthly ones grow in our hearts. So they're very much, there's Abba Moses. And I like to think of Abba Moses, you know, John Cashin was the theologian, really, of the desert who brought the stories together and gave a spiritual map, if you like, he begins with Abba Moses, and I think if he can begin with Moses, the murderer, the, ba the bandit, he can begin with anyone. He can begin with me um, and you. Um, so, he did that. Now, let me introduce you to another figure. Um, Evagrius was the theologian of the desert. Very interesting life. He was born in Pont Pontus, it's called Agnivagris Ponticus, because he was born in Pontus on the Black Sea, in today's uh, Turkey, in 345. His father was a bishop. He was consecrated lector by St. Basil the Great. Then he went to Constantinople, was ordained deacon by St. Gregory Nazianzen, he knew everyone. But he fled the city after having a love affair. Um, and, um, and he suffered a nervous breakdown. And in a dream, he took a vow to become a monk. Now, I wouldn't advise necessarily following through on vows that you can make when you're having a dream, but he did. Um, he took it seriously. He went to Jerusalem and was nursed back to health by Melania, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and she counseled him encouraged him to become a monk. He was a cleric in, a priest in Constantinople. He thought his life was over at the age of 37, but, but Melania clothed him and brought him back to life. Now, this is Evagrius, who I'm quoting from. Now, Evagrius says, in his great work of practicus, if any should wish to know the evil demons from their own experience and become familiar with their art, I would advise them to carefully observe their thoughts. They should pay heed to the intensity and to the ebbing of their thoughts. Um, and when they arise and pass away. So we need to follow through our thoughts. Um, see what's happening within. Then he says they should observe the variety of their thoughts, the regularity with which they recur, the demons responsible. Which gave way to succeeding ones and which which give way to succeeding ones and which do not. Then they should beg Christ to explain everything that they have observed. For the demons are especially infuriated by those who are armed with such knowledge in their practice of virtue. So a lot of focus is on these thoughts. But it's done in the context of prayer. It's done before Christ. And that's essential. This isn't just some going after a shrink. This is done in prayer. And I think when you do it in prayer, it's done in honesty. Um, Abba Anton the Great suggests, write them down. Um, you know, um, record them. 
when you put them put them out there, that helps get them out if you put it in paint on paper. Or if you say them to a friend, that also helps. The more we can do to get them outside ourselves, to reveal, to uncover them, um, the better. Um, this little story, uh, I'm not going to read this out, but um, it's a bit long. But there's a story here um, that's about the different stages. Well, I will read it out. Uh, what does see that none of you replay evil for evil means? The old man said, and passions work in four stages. First in the heart, second in the face, third in words, and fourthly, it's essential not to render evil for evil in deeds. If you can purify your heart, passion, passion will not come into your expression. And if it comes into your face, take care not to speak. But if you do speak, cut the conversation short in case you hit someone. Render evil for evil. Here's a little story from the newspaper. Um, this, is a this is a terrible story, not humorous at all, and yet the humour of, there is only the humour of, gosh, aren't we all so stupid and silly human beings? This is the tragedy of blueberry pie, the blueberry pie. But this could be anybody's story, and I think it could be my story, probably your stories, over a thousand trivial things, because it's often the trivial things in life that causes the problem. You know, what's the, what is your problem with your neighbour? It's probably where they leave their bin, or, you know, I mean, it's the trivial stuff in life that causes conflict quite right often, as well as the big stuff. A dispute over a blue, blueberry pie is believed to have started a chain of events that ended in the apparent murder suicide of a couple who were married for more than 20 years. The Fortland Press Herald reported that Pearl Coxwell, 66, had called a relative to report that her husband objected to her plans to give the blueberry pie to a relative. She then called the police to complain that her husband had thrown a glass of wine in her face. When the police arrived 30 minutes later, they found the bodies of Pearl and her husband Eugene um, dead, Eugene 75. The freshly baked, baked blueberry pie was still on the counter. Police spokesman said it appeared the investigators to the investigators that the, that the destination of a blueberry pie could have started this chain of events. Obviously, he snapped. But this is the problem so much in life, isn't it? That the chain of events, and why don't we stop early on? Why don't we think what we're doing? And so, hence this emphasis, you know, I could easily give a talk about doing good. The, the talk I'm giving is said is about thinking good and watching where the third thought comes from because that is what they're saying. So how, what should we do about it? Well, Evagrius says, it's a bit like catching a mongoose. Well, you all know how to catch mongoose, mongooses, don't you? Um, well, apparently, I think they're very quick, is the answer. And Evagrius says, the only way to catch a mongoose is you have to follow its tracks. That's the only way to get a mongoose is to follow the tracks back to the dead. And, and it's the same with thoughts, really. We have to sometimes think, why am I grumpy today? We talk about getting out of bed and on the wrong side. What does that mean? You know, what are our conversations that make me irritable? Um, I mean, I can have a conversation with one of you here, and you say the wrong thing to me. That puts me on the bad, bad mood. Somebody from over there comes up to me and says something quite pleasant, and I'm not so nice. You know, we, we, or, or something that happens at home, or something that happens with what we project on the other, particularly our nearest and dearest, who we take for granted family, friends. And then we're all smiling, smiling to, uh, uh, you know, to, to other people. And then we're, uh, so think things through. This is not. This is a comical example, but I just give it for a moment of comedy. Olympias troubles troubled by the thought of fornication, which obviously is a problematic area for a monk. He took some mud, made a wife. Took some more mud and made a baby. Thought about feeding and clothing him. 
realised that he wasn't up to it. So the thought of fornication left him. Well, that's one way of it. I don't know how effective that would be, but that's, that's one way of, uh, of thinking. But you get the idea of thinking things through. I'm going to tell the story of your life in five acts. It's an American story, so I'll leave it in the American language. I will act one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Act two. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it's there. I see, sorry, I'm fast. I, I pretend I don't see it, sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Act three. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it's there. I still fall in. It's a habit. That's the excuse for use. My eyes are open. I know where I am. I, it is my fault. I get out immediately. Act four. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. So I can do it again. Um, so I should take time. We act four. Um, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Act five. I don't know if you know what act five might be. Um, I walk down another street. Um, well, I mean, the thing I'm emphasizing, and this comes across in the thoughts. Watch your thoughts. Watch what happens, really. Because our thoughts are important. Um, I could tell a number of more of the stories, but there isn't time. I'm going to give you a sheet with something to put your reflections on thoughts in. But a final thought is this. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Um, so, they go back to the little things. Um, so, I think uh, lots is the time. Um, we have a... Uh, a ten